Amen. Brothers, sisters, friends, and guests, please have a seat this morning. If this is your thousandth time here at the Sea Church, we are glad you're here, that you're hanging out with us. As evidence, if you're newer, you know, Mark talked about that, that God loves us, that he's a friend of sinners. And we let Evan up here with the Broncos jersey. That's some evidence that, that we do invite all to come and to know Jesus here at the Sea Church. And um, friends, I want to tell you something about this season of life that I'm pumped about and invite you to know more about the Pick a Project campaign we're doing and just to praise God for some of the amazing things that are happening in our church and to pump us up toward the finish line of uh, where we're moving as a church right now. Um, there's a verse in Colossians that means a lot to me. It's Colossians 1.24. It's not on the screen, but just listen real briefly. Here's what Paul writes in Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. Here was Paul's understanding of what it means to be a Christian who's loving other people. He says, hey, I'm rejoicing in any of the suffering that comes as a result of being a Christian because what actually moves forward growth and flourishing and in, in beauty in people around me is me filling up in my own flesh the sufferings of Christ. And so Ashley and I, in this season of like building project stuff, it's been amazing to have several project leaders and people helping us. But like on busy weeks, we've been reminding ourselves like, hey, if there was a way that you could end run Christianity so you weren't suffering to love other people, it would no longer be Christianity. If there was a way that in your family or your friendships or your workplace or your marriage or your singleness or your parents, whatever, if there's a place that you could make Christianity convenient for you through and through, it would cease to be Christianity. Because Paul says Jesus took, carried a cross, and, and it was that suffering that he fills up in his flesh that's bringing life to the world around him. And friends, that's true for every part of our lives. Now, what Pharisees do is they say, I'm suffering because it's good to suffer and there's no joy. But Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings, filling up in my flesh Christ's work in your life. A joyful, a joyful amount of doing that. So with that, let me just celebrate in the last three and a half weeks what's been done in the new church campus to give you some timeline stuff and what we're going to try to do going forward to, to push us there where we need to be. In the last three and a half weeks, there has been 69 new light fixtures hung in this church, about 200 feet of electric. We've got a skid steer out there thanks to David Thorne and dropped 20 new posts and over 380 pickets. We put up over 70 gallons of paint, and the Lord has done an amazing amount of work in three and a half weeks. It's been incredible. So we've got about 15 more light fixtures, another 40 gallons of paint. Carpet's going to be torn out of the basement because we're getting 8,000 square feet of new carpet in the kids' ministry in the main area upstairs. I called like eight carpet people. You know how hard it is to find a carpet person right now? I don't know what's going on. Lots of folks buying carpet maybe. I just went over to Jabaris this week and thought, you know, let's just do it. And they had a big commercial thing that had got done of carpet color that was like just what we needed. Regularly $4 a square foot for a buck seventy-five a square foot. And said, hey, that just came in today. If you wouldn't have come here, you wouldn't have found this. I said, put my name on it. Send out the installers. So here's what's happening this week. On Wednesday, they're measuring for the carpet. First week of October, they're laying the new carpet in the kids' ministry. Now, the goal here is we're our first Sunday over there is middle of October. It's like Sunday, October 15th or 16th whatever that Sunday is in the calendar. That means what, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do as a team, is button up the kids' ministry by the first week of October so on the second week, before we have our first Sunday, we can have two or three open houses and kids and families and people can come and get accustomed to the space. Does that make sense? And so here's what uh, I'm asking of the church. If you signed up for Pick a Project, you'll continue to get emails. Now here's what hasn't been happening is we're just sending emails that say, here's when you can work. I'm going to add a link 
so you can let us know your name and maybe the time you're going to be there. Because we've now gone from lots of projects to paint-a-thon 2023. That's basically what it is. It's just painting. Lots of painting is what needs to happen. And if you want to how to paint well, just watch Philip Ziebenberg, and that man can paint. And he's been there painting like a madman. Uh, we could really use your help because we would, I mean, you can paint on top of new carpet, but I'd rather not. So if we could do that, right, up until the beginning of October. But like I said, I mean, we've, we put up over 70 gallons of paint in three and a half weeks. And we have three more weeks until it's time for that carpet to go down. And then there's some auditorium projects and a few other things upstairs before we move in mid-October. So if you signed up for Pick a Project, just keep your eye out for those emails. We'll add a link. And uh, we'd love to have you come on some weeknights or Saturdays when you're available to help get us there for the laying of the carpet. All right, friends. We are in a series right now called Devotion in a Divided World. This series is all about learning that God brings flourishing into our lives as we learn how to be devoted to him in every aspect of our life. And here's what that means, just to be really clear. You, as a believer, are not going to flourish because you avoid hardship. In fact, that could be bad for you. That could actually be the worst thing possible for you, to God, for God to pull hardship or difficulty out of your life. You're also not going to uh, flourish just because you achieve the things that you want to achieve or, or your life goes the way that you want it to go. What is actually going to cause you to flourish and grow and be a blessing to others around you is learning how to be devoted to God in a world that's constantly trying to divide you. And 1 Samuel is all about that. It's a story. It's a narrative. And it's several people that we meet in this book of the Bible, and what God is showing us is what happens in our lives when we're devoted to God versus when we're not. And it's, it's designed to cause us to worship the Lord and to see more of who he is and to learn how to be faithful to him. And so this morning, we're going to jump into chapter 4, and the title of today's sermon is Israel is Divided. We're going to see Israel at a time in their history when things are not very good. And a lot of this book has not been really good yet, right? Eli's family, that's been a pretty big train wreck. There's been this beautiful moment with Hannah and her coming to trust the Lord and Samuel being born and being dropped off at the temple. Here's the five little stops we'll make today in chapter four. Empty religion, God's glory in the world, the power and mystery of God's presence, sowing and reaping, and God is not anxious. We'll kind of attach all the parts of our story to those five pit stops today in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Evan read some of our scripture. Thanks for doing that, brother. Let me read the whole chapter so we can see what the Lord has for us in our story today. 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And Samuel's words came to all Israel. Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle encamped at Ebenezer while the Philistines camped at Aphek. The Philistines lined up in battle formation against Israel, and as the battle intensified, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who struck down about 4,000 men on the battlefield. When the troops returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord defeat us today before the Philistines? Let's bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh. Then it will go with us and save us from our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh to bring back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord entered the camp, all the Israelites raised such a loud shout that the ground shook. The Philistines heard the sound of the war cry and asked, What's this loud shout in the Hebrews' camp? When the Philistines discovered that the ark of the Lord had entered the camp, they panicked. A god has entered their camp, they said. Woe to us, nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who will rescue us from these magnificent gods? 
These are the gods that slaughtered the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Show some courage and be men, Philistines. Otherwise, you'll serve the Hebrews just as they served you. Now be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And each man fled to his tent. The slaughter was severe. 30,000 of the Israelite foot soldiers fell. The ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day, a Benjaminite man ran from the battle and came to Shiloh. His clothes were torn, and there was dirt on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair beside the road, watching, because he was anxious about the ark of God. When the man entered the city to give a report, the entire city cried out. Eli heard the outcry and asked, why this commotion? The man quickly came and reported to Eli. At that time, Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes didn't move because he couldn't see. The man said to Eli, I'm the one who came from the battle. I fled from there today. What happened, my son? Eli asked. The messenger answered, Israel has fled from the Philistines, and also there was a great slaughter among the people. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are both dead, and the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off the chair by the city gate, and since he was old and heavy, his neck broke, and he died. Eli had judged Israel 40 years. Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and about to give birth. When she heard the news about the capture of God's ark and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband, she collapsed and gave birth because her labor pains came on her. As she was dying, the women taking care of her said, Don't be afraid, you've given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel referring to the capture of the ark of God and to the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband, the glory has departed from Israel, she said, because the ark of God has been captured. All right, so dark moment here in Israel's history. They've lost the ark, the most precious thing in Israel's national life. And what does God teach us in this story? Point one, empty religion. So if you remember from our past time here in 1 Samuel, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are not men of integrity. They're running Shiloh like Tammany Hall. You know, it's it's a mafia kind of thing. They're taking sacrifices from the people by force. They're getting fat or they're getting rich off of the sacrifices of the people. And Hophni and Phinehas have also been taking advantage of the young women in the temple. The Bible says, and so an an unnamed man of God had approached Eli and said, Eli, because you have not stopped your sons, in fact, you've encouraged your sons, and your family has taken advantage of God's people for your own gain, here's what's going to happen to you. And it's a serious and terrible prophecy. And then God shows up to young Samuel and tells him the same thing. So in case Eli didn't listen to the unnamed man of God, a whole other person's getting this same message. And unfortunately, Eli doesn't repent. So what's happening at the beginning of chapter 4? Israel's in a battle, and they lose initially. And they go back, and the elders say, why did we lose? The strategy's not working. we got to figure out something. And so here's what they decided. Wait a second. Let's get the ark. Because the Ark of the Covenant, this is where God's presence dwells. To use Star Wars terminology, Israel was saying, enough with the blasters, time to roll in the Death Star. We're going to get the Ark, we're going to show up, and it's going to decimate our enemies. Right? Now here's the problem. Israel doesn't pray. They don't seek God. They don't worship God. Here's what they're doing. They're using God. They're going to use the ark as their WMD. This is their weapon of mass destruction to bring into the camp, and they're going to defeat Philistia with this ark. You know, none of us 
have ever carried the ark of God into a business meeting, a job interview, or a relational conflict to get the upper hand. But in our hearts, we're tempted to do this all the time, to use God instead of seeking him. To use him instead of seeking him. And friends, just so you know, how is Christianity different from other religions? How is it different? Because all religion without the gospel just ends up being this. And here's what I mean. The gospel of Jesus Christ means that relationship with God is deeply intimate and personal. And friends, this is why Jesus Christ, in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though he is losing everything, he has not lost the key thing, which is pleasing his Father. And friends, if you don't have the gospel of Jesus that says that God loves you and he sent his son to die for you and to carry your sin and that he's pursuing you to be in relationship with you, if you lose that, religion is all just transactional. And here's how it works. I go to church and then God, you owe me something. I give some money and God, you owe me something. I do some good works, and God, you owe me something. And though you would never say it, you and I fall into it all the time. Because when stuff goes wrong in our life, the first movement is rarely gratitude. But how could you let this happen? That's there. That's down in the sediment of our hearts. And what drives it out is the truth of the gospel of Jesus. So here's where Israel's at. Israel is not close with God right now. In fact, Hophni and Phinehas are the ones carrying the ark. These wicked men that are taking advantage of people. God's not going to show up and bless them. And so they're both killed and the ark is captured. So we're seeing all this empty religion in Israel right now. Second point, God's glory in the world. You need to notice a really amazing irony in this passage. So Israel's losing. They go back and they just say, hey, let's get the ark. Let's go beat the Philistines. When they show up with the ark, it's amazing that the Bible's showing the Philistines, who don't even know God, are actually approaching God with more care than God's own people are. Because God shows up with the ark to use it, and the Bible says the Philistines, they know so little about the Bible, they assume that Israel worships many gods. You may have noticed uh, here in verse 8. Woe to us, who will rescue us from these magnificent lowercase g gods? These are the gods that slaughtered the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Show some courage and be men, Philistines. So, Amazing irony. Here's Israel just treating God like a pragmatic thing that we use. Hey, let's go get the ark. Let's bring it so we can win. They're just sort of doing their thing. But here's the Philistines. They know barely anything about God. They're the ones using the worshipful language. These magnificent gods, they say. Who's going to save us from the... These are the gods that decimated Egypt and walked Israel through the wilderness and, and gave them the promised land. What are we going to do? And here's the irony of this is, is a couple things. When you read the Old Testament, something you have to catch is that God chose Israel to be, quote unquote, a light to the nations. God told Israel in the Old Testament, listen, here's why I chose you. Because you were nobody's slaves in Egypt. I didn't choose you because you were the best or the strongest or had the most figure out. I chose you, Israel, because I wanted the way that you followed me to cause other nations to see my glory and to know the one true God. Israel, I chose you to be a light that nations could see. It's not by the strength of the horse or the chariot or brilliance or wealth that you succeed in this world, it's by trust in the Lord. And that's why I chose you. But Israel's totally blown it. They're not being a light to the nations. They're showing darkness to the nations. 
And yet, God is still using his reputation to speak his glory into the pagan culture of the Philistines. Or in other words, friends, here's my encouragement for modern contemporary life. If you read the news, you're going to find for the last several decades and centuries, lots of stories about the failure of the church. And it's true. The church globally and the church locally, there's church failures all the time everywhere. There's scandals and moral failures and pastors that hurt people and churches that hide things and cover up scandals and hurt people. And Israel is at a time in their life when they're totally blowing it. And you know what God is doing? He is still showing his glory with or without his people's obedience. With or without it. He's showing his glory and his goodness and his power to the Philistines. Which is just amazing. Here's the other thing I want us to see. Sometimes familiarity can breed boredom. Uh, You know, when I was younger... I didn't really get involved in the church until I was like in high school, like really involved. I started reading my Bible a lot as a freshman or sophomore in high school. Got involved in a youth group around my junior year. But I remembered visiting some youth groups when I was just starting to know God. And I was meeting other students and I was like, why are you here? You don't even want to be here. Why are you here? And I put together, you're here because your parents have dragged you here. That's why you're here. You don't want to be here. And now I look back on that, and what hurts my soul about that is like, man, sometimes the way that we follow God, we get so familiar with him, it's just boring. We don't slow down and stand in amazement that what these Philistines were saying, this magnificent God, we lose language like that around our Father and who he is. And it just becomes hi-ho, humdrum Christianity. And this reminds us, hey, there are people all around us in this city who have never tasted the gospel truth. Doesn't matter what you did last night or what you're guilty about or who you've hurt. If you will really repent of this, God will completely forgive you. There are people who don't know that at all. They have never heard that. They have no idea that Jesus Christ, they kind of think they know the gospel. They think it means we go to church and we be good people. But they haven't heard how good God is. How forgiving he is. How strong and faithful and true he is. And this is a good warning for us that sometimes among God's people, we can lose the sense of how magnificent the Lord is. And outsiders end up saying greater things about our own God than we do. And that's where Israel's at right now. So we have to protect our hearts from walking in foolishness. And we have to recognize that God is bringing his glory into this world with or without the church. But man, what a joy it is to be a part of that. Number three, the power and mystery of God's presence. All right, now as, as we were reading this passage, uh, you may have noticed at the end how dark it gets. So there's this woman, her father-in-law Eli, and her husband Phineas dies. And the Old Testament, you know, sometimes in the Old Testament, you'll read three verses and it covers ten years. At the end of this, we read like five verses that covers one birth. And it's super emotional, right? It says that the The handmaidens of the women are saying, it's okay, you've had a son. And the Bible says she doesn't even pay attention because she's dying. She's looking off in the distance because she's bleeding out. And the child's name is Ichabod, which means the glory is departed. Like they named the child, my life is over. That's what they named their child. My life is over. That's the name of my child. It's so dark. Why is it this dark? It's kind of hard for us as Americans to capture this. Let me help. Let me help a little bit. The idea of the ark being captured, let me try to help us like imagine what that emotionally would be like if you're the nation of Israel. Imagine if national treasure became true 
And a foreign country came in and actually stole the Declaration of Independence like Nicolas Cage. Okay? Assume that happened, number one. Declaration of Independence gets stolen. Supreme Court is taken hostage. Central Bank and Stock Exchange is completely taken over. Power of Congress is deleted. And someone else takes up residence in the White House. That, nationally, is what it felt like for Israel to find out the Ark has been captured. And here's the reason why, right? Israel was a theocracy. That means the center of their social, economic, and moral life was God, and the ark was the center of that. So for the ark to get captured means like we're losing our identity as a people. We're losing everything. Now here's what's hard to put together if you're familiar with the Old Testament. Has anyone ever read... In the next book forward, 2 Samuel, a man named Uzzah in chapter 6. Matt Hatzel shaking his head. He knows Uzzah. I think he preached on it one time at the sea when he was an elder. Here's the story of Uzzah. Later in the story of the Bible, Israel is moving the ark. And an ox slips or breaks its leg or something, and the ark begins to fall. And this man named Uzzah puts his hand out to stop the ark, and the moment he touches it, he drops dead. Dead. Okay, so now, though, we're in 1 Samuel, and a foreign nation has captured the ark. They're manhandling the ark and taking it into their country, and there's no massive deaths breaking out. There, there's, nothing's happening. It's, the ark is just going away. Why? Why, why is it at some moments that people touch the ark or they get near God and they just drop dead and other moments that doesn't happen? And here's the reason why. When you're dealing with God, you're dealing with a personal God. What that means is you can't control God like a force or an energy or a power that you can use like a totem or an ark to get him to be where you want to be or to do what you want to do. God decides when his presence is dwelling mightily with the ark and when it's not. Now, maybe that just sounds like theological jargon. Let me apply it in a way that maybe will strike you personally. Over the years of being a pastor, I've talked to so many Christians about their experiences in the local church. And without fail, when you talk to someone who's had seasons in their life where they've grown a lot, they'll say something like this, man, there was just a time in my life when there was this particular pastor or small group or ministry team or a particular time in the church's life when it felt a certain way or this one friend, or this certain family, or this specific thing, that if I could just get back to that, God would start working in my life again. The church could just feel like that again. If that pastor could be here again, if that friend didn't move away, if that family was still here, if if that thing, if that key ingredient. And then sometimes you make the mistake of thinking, man, if everybody else could experience this, they would know God. But that's a huge error Because here's the error. The key ingredient was never that pastor. It was never that small group or that ministry team. It was never that particular season in the church's life or that friend or that family or that specific thing. The key ingredient was God attached his presence to something and it changed you. So you have to see that because you will live in massive disappointment if you're constantly trying to move toward people or things that you think have the secret sauce to help you. I promise when you get close enough, you'll find out they're just like you. <laughs> they're just people. And it's, it's, it's a local church. And it's a family. And it's a friend. That's great. God, God does amazing things through that, right? But there's, there's no sort of secret sauce in that. 
The reason why there was a lot of work in your life in that season is like just like how God at times magnificently connects his presence with the ark. And at other times it seems to not be there in the same way, friends. There are sometimes certain seasons for reasons we can't control or understand that through a particular person, family, church, or season of life, God just is working. And if we had to ask the question, why does God do that? Christianity would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? If you could just sort of pin down God's presence in some sort of thing or some person you can see or find. Just go have coffee with a person and suddenly feel better. Here's why I think God does that. Because we are so tempted to commit idolatry and worship things that aren't God. God wants to make sure that we are seeking him and not just an experience of him. So he moves. He moves and we're not in control. This thing that seemed to be bringing growth to our, it just goes away. Man, this devotional study was meeting me. It was changing me. It's doing work. Now it's not. Why does it feel so dry? Because God's God and he's a personal God and he wants you to seek him. And that means you just can't go back to the same ark. You can't go back to the same friend. You can't go back to the same thing. And even when we were going to those things, they were never the secret sauce. It was always the presence of God that was there. Does that make sense? Moving on to number four, sowing and reaping. So there's the sad story here about Eli. We see Eli's life come to an end. Here's the biggest thing I caught about this. Eli's 98. He's now been told twice by the unnamed man of God and by Samuel that his sons would die on the same day. Here's what kind of hit me. Did you notice Eli did not rock back and break his neck when he found out his sons died? That's not what got him. That didn't surprise him. And that's sad. But I think here's something the Bible's showing us that's helpful for relationships. The Bible's been showing us so far in this story that Eli was honoring his sons more than God. That's what the unnamed man of God said to Eli. He said, Eli, you're honoring your sons more than God. And what that means is you, you keep on giving your sons a pass. You're not disciplining them. You're not showing them the ways of God. You're, for whatever reason, you're partaking in this sin and not leaning into it. And over time, it's almost like Eli's love for his sons has like mutated into this sort of irritated indifference. And he finds out his sons die, and he's just like, well, they had it coming. I think there's something of like a warning here that shows in relationships. I mean, relationships are hard. I don't care who you are, how many books you've read. How many things we think we know about like managing conflict or whatever. It's hard all the time, every time. It just is. It just is. Got to embrace that. Be humble. Walk with a limp. Recognize that's how it is. But I think the Bible showing us that Eli never really leaned. He never really pushed himself to fight for something healthy with his sons. And so it just kind of transformed into something that was just Super dysfunctional. His sons die. He doesn't fall. But then he finds out the ark's been taken. And his sons were the ones carrying it. Friends, we don't know the last thoughts that were in Eli's heart and mind. Okay, I have no idea what he was thinking as he fell. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I wonder if it was something like this. I had no idea that what I thought was such a small sin of just not walking in a godly way in my family has led to this. Maybe his last thought was, I never dreamed that what I thought was such a small deal 
of just kind of having an area of my life that I wouldn't listen to God and wouldn't let him in and wouldn't repent. And I was going to do my thing. I thought that was small and controlled and was never going to burn like a wildfire. And now I've found out that sin has led to the ark is gone and falls and breaks his neck. Now, here's why I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that to shame you or guilt you. If you're feeling some pinch right now, I'll give that to the Holy Spirit. Here's what I will say. Friends, Eli's problem was not that he was a sinner. We're all sinners. You fall short and I fall short. On our best day, one of my favorite quotes from John Bunyan, the best prayer I ever prayed had enough sin in it to damn the whole world. On your best day, you're nowhere near the righteousness of God. When you think you're killing it, like Isaiah teaches, your righteousness is like filthy rags. Lest you're carrying some pride or a sense that you're knocking it out of the park, you're not. We've all got a lot of Kadarius Tony in us, all right? We drop a lot of balls. We drop a lot of balls. Friends, Eli's problem was not that he was a sinner. We're all sinners. Eli's problem is, is that God, in so many ways, approached him and approached him and approached him, and he wouldn't let God in. And what he thought was just a small deal, come to find out, it's not a small deal. And brothers and sisters, that's true for all of us. We, we, we fight for holiness and we fight to grow and we fight to repent because God is good and God is loving and he's a father and he doesn't throw stuff in our face and he pinches us with the conviction of the Holy Spirit because he knows that sin does really hurt us. And he's calling us out of it. But Eli's story is a good Warning for us, Eli is reaping what he sowed at his age of 98. Don't let that story beat you into the ground. Let that story encourage you, draw you out, and see God's loving heart for you, right? Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, he goes and ruins everything, and when he comes back, the father's not inside tapping his foot saying, come give me your story and maybe I'll forgive you. The father runs out to the son and kisses him. Says, we're going to kill all the animals in here for a party right now. Here's a robe, here's a ring. You're home and I love you. If you think that opening your soul to broken parts in your life and letting God in, no matter what is you're ashamed of, what you're, if you think that opening it up, you're going to get a God who says, told you you should have fixed that a long time ago. Man, that is not the Father. He loves you. He heals us. He cares for us. He pursues us. And so we should turn to him, love him, and learn from Eli. Number five, God is not anxious. Like I mentioned, these last few verses were really dark about this, this uh, mother dying, naming her child Ichabod and the ark being captured and gone from Israel. But here's what's amazing. God is not anxious. I have to tell myself this all the time when I feel busy. And in our culture, you all feel busy, don't you? I don't talk to anybody who ever says, I'm not busy. We're all busy. Every season, every stage of life, we're all busy. You know? 15 years ago, I said I was busy. People that were quite a bit older than me were kind of like, yeah, he's not busy. You know? You know. But I was. Because in every season of life, you, just, you find stuff to fill it with. And then you're kind of blown away as you get older. Like, how do I have capacity to do all these things? Maybe the Lord is going to show me I've got more capacity than I think, right? We're all busy. Something that so centers me is, remember, God is not anxious. 
God doesn't worry. He doesn't fret. He doesn't get tied up. God knows the beginning from the end. He's good. He's kind. He's sovereign. God is always joyful. God has no needs. He has no needs. In fact, when I serve God, it's like the crayons and paper that he gave me, I draw a really ugly picture and God puts it on the fridge. Not because it's good art, but because he loves me. And if you're a parent, you know you got some bad art in your house, don't you? And you're proud of it. But your kids can't draw. I don't care how good they are. They can't draw. They're not great, but we think they are. And everything that we give to God, everything that we're doing, we're not giving anything back to him he doesn't already have. Can't just generate on his own. God's not anxious. He's not worried. He's not concerned. Ark is leaving Israel. God's not freaking out. Women are dying. Babies are squealing. 30,000 men are dead. Everything's broken. God is not worried. In fact, we're going to find out next week, it was all a part of his plan that this ark would actually go to the Philistines by itself. And we're going to see that God, all on his own, can do whatever he wants with a piece of wood with Ten Commandments in it without a single person helping. God doesn't need anybody to do what he wants to do. I mean, heavens, at the beginning he spoke, let there be light. And there was light. He speaks in things form. Which means as he invites us in, as he does work in our life, as he calls us to be invested in the lives of others, we're not using our own resources that we've drummed up to do something that God could do no other way. Just like what I talked about with Paul in Colossians, when Paul says, it is my joy to suffer for you, to fill up in my flesh the sufferings of Christ for the good of the church. If you and I are not taking seriously our call to be a blessing to our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, our friends, our church, filling ourselves up with service to others, God is not in heaven saying, man, what am I going to do without them? You know, that's the A-team right there. I can't get that done without them. The only person who's missing out is us on the Lord's work in our life. Because grace upon grace, he would use us to do that work. But if we're not going to step up to the plate, he'll do it anyway. He'll do it some different way. We just won't be a part of it. We just won't be a part of it. So God's not anxious, friends. And as we remind ourselves of that, it helps us to not be anxious even when the wheels come off the cart. And friends, sometimes the wheels come off the cart. This is a pretty bad wheel off the cart moment. Huge battle, ark is gone, God is still in control. One last thought to land the plane this morning. I talked about earlier that um, sometimes just maybe a friend in your life or a particular season in a church's life or a ministry or something that you feel God working through and you just wish you could get back to that. There was one thing I didn't tell you then that I want to tell you now to finish our sermon. There is one place, there is one place that you can always go and you will always experience the richness of God's presence. And his name is Jesus. God's glory forever dwells with the Son, the Bible teaches. Always. And now maybe you're thinking, well, Ryan, that's great, but you see, I can't go over to Jesus' house because... I can't find Jesus in that sense. What do you mean I'm going to Jesus or finding God's glory in Jesus? Let me give you some help. One of the ways that you can meet Jesus is by using the Bible, opening up the Psalms, the New Testament, anywhere you want in the Bible, reading what's there, meditating on it, and whatever you see there, slow down. Think through what it means that Jesus came and died and rose from the dead, and what that scripture means in light of that. Let me give you one help. So this morning is the the 10th. That's right, right? Yeah, it's the 10th. 
That means Psalm of the Day for me was Psalm 100. There's like a system you can use to pick a psalm for a day in the book, praying the Bible. Still use that. Psalm of the Day was Psalm 100. Got up and looked at Psalm. It's only a few verses. And it talks about, let's praise the Lord. Let's go into his temple and courts with praise. Let's love God. And I just slow down and meditate. Man, why, why is it that this is true? That I can go into the church today with lots of joy and just start meditating on Jesus. He carried all my sin. He's faithful to me. He never leaves me. He died on the cross with me in his heart. As the song says, his, my, my name is engraved on his hands. He rose from the dead to give me new life. Man, as we take time to meditate on Christ and who he is, it really does change us. Just like eating a meal brings nutrients into your life, Something about meditating on Christ through the word that slowly changes us. Hey, if you want to go to the gym and work out, that's great. If you do it once, you'll be really sore and won't look any different. You do it for a year with consistency, you look different. You open your Bible one time and seek Jesus, didn't change me. Do it for a year. Go to the word. Eat. Meditate. Sit in it just for a couple minutes a day. Let it begin to fill you up and bring light to your life. Final thing for friends that are online. There's some friends online. Their names are Shirley and Jerry. And I got to know them through a family here at the church. And Shirley and Jerry live about an hour or so north of us. And, and they're in their house and have trouble traveling. And they, they give to our local church and they tune in every Sunday to, to watch. I, I called Shirley this morning. Uh, and I always tell, when I call her on Sundays, I'm like, hey, Shirley, I'm not going to see you, but you'll see me, but it's, you know, good to have a phone call with you. And, and uh, Shirley and Jerry are older, and they're faithful saints, and um, Shirley and Jerry have so shown me over time of getting to know them, I'm talking to them, man, things just go wrong, and God is still good. And that's how they live. And that's who they are. And it's been sweet to talk to them, get to know them. And so I would just encourage you, hey, whether it's gospel communities, little accountability group, friendships, whatever it is, man, just having people in your life that you can do this with. Meditating on Christ. Knowing him. Walking in community. Man, it really does change us, friends. It changes us. Guys, I love you. I am loving this series. I hope you are too. Next week, as we get back together, we're going to see the Lord do something incredible all on his lonesome in a foreign territory, and it's a pretty amazing chapter of Scripture. So join us next week. Invite a friend. If you signed up for Pick a Project, we've got your email. Look out for that. Gospel community signups, I think, are still open. Maybe some GCs have already started. If you have any questions, you can connect to Mark about that. And Seed Youth is in full swing. We had our first Wednesday, getting back together this coming Wednesday as well. Friends, if you want to connect, grab one of these cards on the windowsill, scan the QR code, you can get involved in our local church. Pray with me. Father God, your word is always true. And you're always speaking through it. And Lord, we just need ears to hear it. And we need a community of friends and brothers and sisters to help us apply it. And Lord, this morning, even as I was preaching, Father, I think what stuck out most of my heart was just the familiarity of Israel with you and just losing sight of how magnificent it is, God, that you in all your glory and beauty and power, you don't just make time to be deeply interested in our lives, but you find joy in it. God, that you're everywhere all at once and you hear all my prayers. God, if, God, if I really believe that, man, I would pray so much more. God of all creation hears me all the time. God, would you break through in whatever season we're in? If there's any places in our life that we just kind of have this stale familiarity with you, 
kind of a by the numbers, business as usual, running my schedule and kind of doing the Christian thing. Lord, would you come and, and grab that and just crush it this morning? And would you open our eyes up to your beauty and magnificence, your perfect hand over all creation and history, and we have the unbelievable privilege of knowing you, worshiping you, and invited into a relationship with you. God, let that land this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would teach us that when we go to the ark and it seems like you're not there, that we would not just try to look for little tastes of your presence in all the old places, but we would really seek after you to find you, God, to sit in your presence. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.